Good evening, and welcome to the Springfield Community Preservation Committee meeting. My name is Karen Lee, Administrative Consultant, and today is June 2nd, 2020. And for the record, the time now is 6.20. The recording secretary is Suzanne Jobel. If you are listening to this recording without video, the notice on the screen reads, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to the governor's executive order concerning the open meeting laws, the city of Springfield is providing public notice that this public meeting will be conducted using remote collaboration technology. This remote public Zoom meeting can be viewed on channel 17 on Springfield's Comcast network, Focus Springfield Community TV website, focusspringfield.com slash watch slash government, on Facebook, Focus Springfield, and also on the Springfield Community Preservation Committee Facebook page. The committee will take public comments at the end of the meeting from those who submitted a request in advance for the Zoom link. The next meeting of the CPC is on June 25th, and if you would like to make a public comment at that meeting, send a request to cpc at springfieldcityhall.com. Written public comments are accepted until June 5th, either by email, cpc at springfieldcityhall.com, or mail your comment to City Hall, Community Preservation Committee, 36 Court Street, Room 412, Springfield, Mass, 01103. All comments become part of the public record. We do our best to keep the Zoom links secure. Anyone with a link is placed into the waiting room until your identity is confirmed. Once you are in the meeting, your mic is placed on mute until called upon to comment. At that time, please identify yourself for the record. If you see your audio is on, please mute yourself if you are not speaking as it interrupts the video and the speaker. Tonight, we'll hear from nine applicants for CPA funding, and it's the last of three sessions to hear presentations from individuals or groups who have submitted an application for a Community Preservation Act grant. In order to encourage applications from individuals and civic groups for community-related projects, the committee held two outreach workshops with plans to increase outreach in 2020. The committee welcomes your input and suggestions to increase outreach. Please send an email to Lee at springfieldcityhall.com or if you'd like to be placed on our email list. You can also leave a message on the Springfield Community Preservation Committee Facebook page. The Community Preservation Act was created upon adoption by the Massachusetts voters in November 2016. This is Springfield's third year of grant funding. The CPA is created via a 1.5 surcharge on real estate taxes for residential, commercial, and industrial properties. And the Statewide Community Preservation Act Trust Fund distributed to municipalities and funded by Registry of DPs. In this cycle, there is approximately $1.7 million of funding available for the Springfield area. Projects funded in prior years are available to view on the city website, springfield.ma.gov, on the Community Preservation Committee page. CPA funds are available to individuals or groups for recreational and open space, historical preservation, and community housing. Nine members serve on the committee and are appointed to serve a three-year term. Three members are neighborhood representatives and one member each from the Historical Commission, Planning Board, Conservation Commission, Park Commission, and the Springfield Housing Authority. Tonight we'll hear from applicants who are applying for nine projects. One, emergency rental assistance for COVID-19 by Wayfinders. Two, building beauty for the community. Three, you reuse wood to rebuild wealth by Greater New Life Christian Center. Heritage Foundation, I'm sorry, Highland Heritage Trail. McKnight District Common Areas. Preservation Revolving Fund. Model Mixed Income Affordable Ownership. And Trinity House Women in Crisis Shelter. I'm sorry, in Classical High restoration. And with that, I'll turn the meeting over to our chairman, Robert McCarroll, to introduce the rest of the committee. 
thank you for being here. Okay, well, thank you very much, Karen. Um, welcome everyone tonight. We're sorry about the technical difficulties. And Karen, as the meeting goes on, we're missing Lamar. So if you could be reaching out to him to see whether he's able to join us as we're um, in process. So we are, um, tonight we have uh, so far present um, Gloria DiFilippo, the planning board representative, David Finn, the historical commission representative, Juanita Martinez from Conservation, Terry Mitchell of Neighborhood, uh, Terry Rodriguez, the Park Department, Ralph Slate, Neighborhood Rep, Willie Thomas, the Housing Authority, and me, Bob McCarroll, um, the Springfield Preservation Trust. They were hoping that Lamar Cook, our other neighborhood representative, will be joining us. Um, you know, as we enter year three, we have 25 applications to consider. Um, they're asking for nearly $4 million. We only have a million three to recommend. The 25 projects come from Brightwood, Memorial Square, East Springfield, Indian Orchard, 16 acres, Forest Park, Six Corners, McKnight, Metro Center, and uh, citywide. Um, so what our process tonight will be is everyone will be given five minutes um, David Finn will time them. Um, he will give you a warning saying four minutes, and then he'll give you the times up at the five minute mark. Please complete your sentence, not with the run on compound sentence that your English teacher would have marked you down for. Um, then we will have questions from committee members um, to which you get to respond. Um, Afterwards, we will, at the end of the month, we will actually start our deliberations, um, vote on our recommendations, send them to City Council. It is City Council who awards the money, not us. Um, and we can never predict what the City Council timetable is, but usually it would, I expect they will be taking action in, in the autumn. Um, and then, of course, the Law Department has to draw up contracts. So, um, it's a process that, that takes a while. And uh, I guess we're getting, we're ready to go. So the first presentation is Emergency Rental Assistance for COVID-19 by Wayfinders. I'm Lauren Boyer. I'm the Senior Vice President for Housing Support Services at Wayfinders. And I'd like to start off by telling you a bit about Wayfinders. Some of you may already know about us, but I thought it would be helpful to just give you a thumbnail sketch. Um, and then my colleague, Mary Beth Dowd, will talk to you about the proposal and the RAFT program. And um, obviously, um, like we just stated, we'll have some time at the end for you to ask questions. So um, Wayfinders has operated in Springfield for close to 50 years. Um, as you may know, we've collaborated with the city on a variety of projects over the years. And um, our organization is one of nine regional administrating, administering agencies statewide. Uh, we operate a wide range of programming in Hampshire and Hamden County, which includes uh, Section 8 rental assistance, uh, affordable housing development and management, uh, emergency, emergency assistance shelters for families, and our Housing Consumer Education Center. Um, the Department of Housing and Community Development funds the Residential Assistance for Families in Transition Program, otherwise known as RAFT, which is administered by our uh, staff in our Housing Consumer Education Center. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Beth to talk a bit about our proposal and how it ties in with the RAFT program, um, and I'm, we'll take your questions at the end. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Dowd, and I am the Chief Program Officer at Wayfinders, and I'm just gonna share, um, oh, I can't share, that's okay, don't worry. Um, so Wayfinders is proposing to create and implement a program called Emergency Rental Assistance for families who um, have been affected by COVID-19. We, this program will address the risk of homelessness that exists for renters in Springfield who are experiencing the negative 
economic impacts due to the coronavirus epidemic. The, these negative impacts are threatening their ability to pay their rent. And even though currently there is a moratorium on evictions, that eventually will be lifted and families will be responsible for paying all of the past due and current rent. We seek to expand the safety net that already is provided by existing programs like RAFT or which is called the Rental Assistance Program for Families in Transition. What we do is provide short-term rental assistance to low-income individuals and families. Um, through this program, we propose to expand that safety net by providing the same type of assistance to people who are not covered by the RAFT program either because they don't meet the qualifications or because we are out of funding. We have a limited amount of funding in the program. Since this, program, this crisis began, we have received over 1,100 applications for rental assistance from people living in the city of Springfield. We have only received um, about $382,000 from the Commonwealth to serve all applicants for rental assistance in Hamden and Hampshire County. So as you can imagine, that's not gonna go very far. We, we believe that this money will allow, allow us to provide services to at most about 200 people. And um, we have to provide that assistance to people living in all of Hampton and Hampshire County. We believe that the funding we currently have will be spent by the middle of July. And we are um, looking for assistance from this program to allow us to be able to continue to help the people living in the city of Springfield. We propose to um, help them by providing money for their rent arrearages. There'll be a maximum of 4,000 per household that will be um, allowed. We won't, everyone won't get 4,000. They will each be assessed and um, given an, an amount based on what they need to pay their rent arrearages. We hope to serve at least 53 low-income Springfield um, residents, but um, it could be more than that, depending on the need of each individual. We want Mary to Beth, prevent, yes. Not to interrupt, but you've got about uh, another 30 seconds or so. Okay, and I'm, that's pretty much done. Basically, this program also helps landlords because if um, it allows them to receive back rent, which they need <laughs> because they're trying to raise their families as well and keep their families housed. And, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'll start seeing whether committee members have questions and we'll go down the list. So Gloria, any questions? Yes, what is the 15% um, for the administration? What does that entail? That pays for the services provided by Wayfinders. And so it pays our staff to, um, not only to reach out and advertise this program and make sure that the people of Springfield are aware that it exists, but also then to um, create and collect the applications, screen people for appropriateness for this program or appropriateness for other programs that may better suit them or both. Um, and, and then for us to administer the checks to the landlords. Okay, and then could someone potentially um, accept money from the RAFT program and from the emergency rental assistance? In the past, I would have just said no. And honestly, we are going to screen them to make sure that, um, that, that, that they haven't already received money through the RAFT program. If, but COVID has changed a lot of the rules and it could be that if someone came back in with a new need because something had happened, we, we, we might be able to help them, um, but we still will have that $4,000 cap and that will be applied across both programs. So perhaps if they've got, if in June, they got $1,200 from the RAF program, they come back and apply in the fall when we have this money available and they need another $1,200, um, we might be able to help them, yes. Okay, thank you. No more questions, Bob. Okay. Hey, uh, David, any questions? Yeah, Mary Beth, you mentioned that this might help landlords as well. Mm -hmm. um, are those Springfield-based landlords? Yes, because these would all be Springfield. Well, 
they're all for properties in Springfield. I can't tell you that all the landlords live in Springfield, right. but this okay. would only be for renters living in Springfield. Understood. Okay. And I had a couple other questions similar to Gloria. So uh, those have been answered. Thank you. Okay. And, and just for further clarification, the payments go to the landlord for yes. the rent arrearages. They, they go directly to the landlord. Oh, thank you, Lauren. You're welcome. Juanita, any questions? You have to unmute yourself, Juanita. The only question I have is because of, because how, how long it takes for you to get the money through CPA, will that be too late for the, for the, um, the renters? You know, I mean, it, it's still- I, I hear what you're saying. I think that what we're expecting is some of the need to come in waves, that there are people who have been okay because they were able to receive um, unemployment or some of the other um, supplemental monies that have come because of COVID. And honestly, in the fall, we do expect to see another round of people in need who were able to sort of hang on through these months, but now um, are still not back to work and are struggling. If, if, if you didn't get this money, do you have any other sources of source of money to, to help them until if if you did get this application and um, until you, the money would be I understand uh, honestly we're we're we do believe that there are funds coming we just don't believe that it's enough to meet the need of all of the applications i mean we in total have um over 2000 applications right now um, in all of Hampton and Hampshire County, and I don't think we're going to get enough money to help everyone who needs it, even from all the different sources. Would you agree with that, Lauren? Uh, yes, I would. Oh, okay. Hello, Henry. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Juanita. Henry Mitchell, any questions? Janita and um, had asked my question, so I'm, I'm, I pass. Okay. Um, um, Rodriguez, any questions? I'm not seeing Terry. Terry Rodriguez. She may have stepped away. So we'll move on. Ralph Slate. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 oh, somebody else talking? Hold, hold, yeah, hold on. I think Terry Rodriguez, are you there? Do you have no. This is Terry Rodriguez. Hello? Do you have any questions for us, Terry? Terry, you're muted. Is this strictly for Springfield? Yes, this, these funds would only be used for residents of Springfield. All right, the rest of my questions have been answered. Thank you. All right, Ralph, questions? Yes, I know that he certainly have, has uh, far more applicants for rental assistance than it can provide. So my question is, how do you differentiate somebody who is being affected specifically by COVID versus somebody who just typically would need to be helped? And how is this not just essentially another, you know, just, just adding to the current number of rental vouchers that are being used in Springfield? So... So rental assistance vouchers are different from this type of rental assistance. This is emergency rental assistance of a one-time only payment of rental arrearages. And how we differentiate um, that it's COVID related is through our assessment process. We ask them why, they're, why they've had a negative impact and why they can't pay their rent or haven't been able to pay their rent. And the reason has to be related to a COVID issue. They lost, um, you know, they were laid off, they were furloughed, um, their hours have been decreased, whatever the reason may be. Yep. They were ill and couldn't work. Yep. Yes. Um, they had to take care of someone who right. was ill, so had yep. to leave their job. And like Mary Beth had mentioned earlier, there is a moratorium right now. Um, there's a moratorium right now on evictions. Um, we, ex it's, a, it's supposed to be uh, lifted in the next couple of months. Um, we're all hopeful that maybe it'll be extended, but then again, you know, we don't, we just, everything's so up in the air, we really don't know. 
Ralph, was, did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Oh, Willie, Thank you, Ralph. Any questions, Willie? Someone might have to unmute Willie for it. Oh. Can you hear me? You yes. You can hear me now? We can. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Just one quick question. Um, you said that the community preservation, um, this request is allowable spending purposes and you cite a regulation that qualifies the community preservation committee to authorize funding of this proposal. Are yes. you following me? Yes, I am. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit more about that regulation? What regulation is that? I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Well, if you look at the Department of Revenue's allowable uses chart, where everyone should have it, um, under okay. support of community housing, and one of the things that's ah. on is, is rental assistance. Okay, very good. I will check. Thank you. All right. So no more questions. All right. Thanks, Willie. So I, I guess my only most of my questions have already been asked and answered. So my only question is, is are you applying to other CPCs throughout the region for help with this kind of program? Yes, um, we're both we're applying and we're being approached and asked to uh, apply. Um, right now, we're currently in process with three other towns. Two other two or three other towns, um, and and we expect there will be more. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. I think you know, for those committee members, I can see. If anyone have any more questions? Raise your hand. Otherwise, we will assume that the questions have been asked and answered. Thank you so much. Excuse me, Bob. Um, just one quick interruption. We have a, a person who came into the room. I don't have her or his name. Telephone number is 221-6826. If you can unmute yourself and let us know who you are, please. Last four digits, 6826. You're currently called unnamed caller. Okay, not sure who that person is then. Okay. And I guess, have you heard from Lamar at all? No, I just sent him another um, message. All right, well, moving on then. Thank you very much, our Wayfinders. Um, the next presentation is Building Beauty for the Community. Paul, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. All right, good day or good evening, everyone. My name is Paula Starnes. I am the executive director and job training coordinator for YSET Academy, which is youth social educational training in Springfield in the South End. We've been in existence for 17 years. We first started off at South Congregational Church. We then moved um, right around the corner at the corner of School Street and High Street. Uh, this is a job training program for the young people, high school, high schoolers, I should say, in Springfield. I am also a high school English teacher at Putnam High School, and I am a professor at AIC. So I'm just really invested in the community with reference to helping young people uh, gain the knowledge to gain employment, which is why we have this job training program. Um, okay. I... Uh, was going to share the screen, but that's okay. I was going to show you some things, but um, I can just talk through it. Now with uh, building beauty for the community, we have the building for young people to attend our job training program, ages 15 to 18. We've actually recently uh, gone beyond 18 years of age because we've joined with Greater New Life Christian Center to help those who have been affected by COVID, to help them get uh, the skills needed for them to get gainfully employed. But uh, in essence, we want to make sure that all of the young people and young adults who attend 
our job training program that they are ready equipped to get out there and get employed. So for this program, Building Beauty in the Community and for the Community, we're asking that you help us to replace the broken windows and to repoint the brick. Now, to, to get funded for this project, we can help our young people and all of those who are coming to us for job training appreciate the place that they're in. And also, it will help us to keep warm the place that they're in. We do all of our job training at the 57 School Street site, and it really just would help us out tremendously if the CPC could help us uh, make our building functional and beautiful at the same time. So really, without my visuals, that's it. I think I beat the five minute mark. Okay, so we'll start with questions. Do you have any questions? Not at this time. All right, uh, moving on to David. Yes, uh, Dr. Stearns, the business management fee of 20%, can you just elaborate on that a bit? Yes, the business management, that's going to be handled by the contractors. We have uh, area contractors that's going to be working the grant to make sure that the building is pristine. Everything that we have in the building has been approved by the city because it is a school for young people. So anytime you have a building that houses young people and educates young people, it just um, heightens the threshold to what types of work can be done on the premises. So that's handled by our contractors. Okay. Yeah, and everything else seems pretty well detailed. So um, thank you. I have no further questions. All right, uh, Juanita, any questions? Juanita, unmute yourself. Uh, I don't have any questions. Oh, all right. Thank you, Thank you for, the, for submitting the proposal. All right. Thank um, you. Families first. Terry Mitchell, any questions? I have no questions. It was clear. All right. Uh, Terry Rogers, any questions? Yes, I, I just want to know, is, is it only up to the age of 18? Well, we recently extend be, extended beyond 18. And thank you for asking that question, Terry, because I neglected to add, we pay $20 an hour to attend our job training. And one of the reasons, this is why I needed my business, but again, thank you for asking that. Um, we pay our students, and we will do those over 18 the same ways, the $20 an hour, that's what we're shooting for. Uh, to make sure that they invest in their learning. Because as an English teacher, it's just important to have our young people and those young adults who will be coming to us um, ready to write well, speak well, represent themselves well, so that they can, again, um, get fully employed. Our yeah, I, I just want to know, because I know some kids are a little challenged, and they don't always get out there at the age of 18 they start to get more, more confident and stuff at the age of 19, 20. So I just want to know, do they have an opportunity to participate in the program too? Yes, now going with Greater New Life, they have, um, at Greater New Life, there's a, a carpentry workshop that has uh, really highly skilled, or like um, the equipment that they have really needs highly skilled carpenters to work on the equipment. So you'll see right after this proposal, Greater New Life is going to come up to talk about um, the, the teachers that are going to be teaching and getting skills to these people so that they can learn how to be carpenters. So to answer your question, Terry, yes, we are going beyond the age of 18 so that they too can get skilled and get paid job training at its finest. Thank you so much for your proposal. Thank you. Ralph, any questions? Hi, Paula. Uh, could you clarify, did you say that you're going to replace the windows with brand new windows, or are you going to restore the windows that are currently there? That's also a great question. Um, Springfield Preservation and Trust, who gave us a support letter, really advocated for us to restore the windows. I had Pam Howland, um, Old Window Workshop, uh, who's also in this um, stream live, 
she assessed the windows and she could speak a little bit to that if you don't mind, Pam. Yeah, uh, Ralph, uh, as you know, I, um at the old window workshop in, in uh, the South End, and we've done an awful lot of windows. Um, but the thing about the windows on at 37 School Street is that there is not one original window in, in the, hurts. the building. Um, I think my best guess is that they were replaced back in the 50s or 60s, um, and they're not really um, going to do that they're not really working for insulation purposes or draft stopping um pam can i don't know can anybody else hear pam can you hear me everyone we can we can hear you paula we can. Yeah, i couldn't hear pam okay so i wonder if just I, what she said is she looked at all of the windows and in her opinion none of them are original to the building uh, meaning going back to the 1890s or early 1900s, that they were installed in the mid 20th century. So whether it was in the 60s or the 70s, that's the windows that are there. So I guess, Ralph, do you have a follow-up question? Ralph, you I'm sorry, Bob, I couldn't quite hear you. I heard you say that they were not original to the building, but could you clarify when she felt as though those windows had been installed? In the 60s or 70s. So, okay, I don't have any other questions. Yep. All right. So I guess, Pam, just clarify for me, are the windows that are there wood or are they of some metal or vinyl or some other material? Yeah, they're, they're fiberglass. And fiberglass, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were expensive at one point. All right, thank you. Um, Willie, any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, and I guess my only question in is, it would be helpful for us to know what are the 17 windows? So if, if between now and the next week, if, even if it's a low-tech solution to take the photographs that are in your application and circle the windows, it, it's hard to see where you're going to be doing the work. Can you do that for us, Paul? Okay. Um, Bob, there's a, Steve says there's an unnamed person that is left into the room. Uh -huh. And if you could ask them to identify themselves. Yeah, they already did that. But, um, no, it sorry. says 413-221-6826. We have that Steve Gray, right? Oh, that's Steve Gray. All right. All set. All right. There you I go. Think so. All right. Okay. So, uh, Paula, if you could, uh, you, you probably mail that to us. Um, email. Yeah. If if that's if you can indeed do that, you could email it to us at cpc at springfieldcityhall dot com. The same place you sent the electronic application. All right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. So the next presentation is reuse wood to rebuild wealth. Um, I am Pam Howland and I wrote the grant application and so Jackie Stimmage Norwood asked me. To I'm sorry, is there any way that Pam could speak up? I cannot hear a word at all that she's saying. Wow, okay. Yeah, uh, your volume is way down, Pam. Okay, now it's up to 60. Can you hear me? Barely. Wow. Okay, I've got 76, 86. Um, well, I think, it, I think it's actually on your microphone, so you might have to just speak up very loudly. Okay. Um, so, I don't make Jackie, it penetrate, it too much. No, it's just too much. I hear that. I don't want to speak but, over anyone. It's uh, your but, five minutes of presentation. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> for the last four years, I've been watching uh, so many really valuable materials be sent out of Springfield that could be creating jobs in Springfield. And these are materials out of historic buildings. 
Um, so I'm sure that we, <laughs> we don't want to waste money at all ever for anything. Um, and the I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but I don't know if anybody else is having this problem, but I still can only hear a very faint whisper. And if I can't hear this, I don't know what to really do about that. So let, let me suggest this, Pam and Steve Carey. I will go on to the next presenter, and Pam can call in and speak to us by the phone, and she can then see us by the, by the video. But does that, does that work? So let, That'll work. Let me go on to the next presenter, and then we'll go back to Pam when she's called in. Um, so the next presenter is Highland Heritage Trail. So Charlie, unmute yourself, and you have five minutes. Yes, I'm going to look down on what I've written because I planned for 10, and I tried to cross off to make it five. So here we go. Good evening, members of Springfield Community Preservation Committee and the residents of the city. A few months ago, I was asked if I would be a point person proposing ways to use bicycle and other transportation to tie parts of the McKnight District with the PBTA, interstate bus, and rail lines at Union Station because I have made the comment that such a trail needs to have multiple destinations and reasons for its use. The folks know I have bicycled and use a bicycle mainly for my transportation, except for the long distance I have to use a bus. I said I was willing to do this, and I thought of the trail, the Nowatic Trail in Amherst, that I used to use daily when I was an intern at UMass. In that trail, you have many shops, go eventually to a mall and then a second mall, and a place where there was ice cream, a place where there was water and air for your bicycle, and then finally over to Northampton. All along, there were places to get off and go to shops and travel to use other areas. Any trail that does not have those places to go and buy things or do things is, in my opinion, doomed to failure. In Springfield, we have a portion of our river walk that goes nowhere. It's okay for a registrar to ride, but hardly anybody does that. So, the thing that is true for the area of having a trolley is that a vintage trolley would also carry some bicycles. Then people would take it to Union Station and connect with PBTA and other bus routes to get to work. By having a trolley running many times a day, the area would be used to the chance of vandalism and negative things less of a probability. A main part of this proposal would be to evaluate the support for such a project by the various communities to which it would go, the stakeholders it would ass and assess their viability for this project and with the assurance that vintage trolley cars would obtain and give the look and feel of yesteryear while having bicycle racks to make the transportation current for today. The example I'm thinking of is the Berkshire Scenic Railway that for years has run a small line that people buy tickets to ride on back as a destination all by itself. Perhaps this can also be a destination for people in the city and those who come to visit. I think that in addition to the trolley, maybe some future expansions make another attraction for people in our city, as I just mentioned, and reliable transportation for citizens to augment the service currently provided by PBTA and give more traffic on the line to just a few bicycles and also act as a block to see what maintenance needs to be done. We hope you will assist in this project so everyone on bicycle or taking a trolley can enjoy some of the part of the city while going from their shopping or transit to and from work. Great work has been done in planning this in, by many people in the past. And we would like to be able to see something that addresses some of the concerns the mayor had about how it would be maintained, how it would be protected, whether people would use it. I think that's about it. I have a little thing to show that but I can send the MP4 file to the committee and you can look at it on your own computer. All right, thank, thank you, Charlie. So admit the pot. I hope I was under five minutes. You would have heard from David if you weren't. Yeah, you still have a minute and thirty-five seconds, Charlie. That's better than going over by six. <laughs> All right. So we'll start with questions. Uh, Gloria, any questions? Yes, um, Charlie. The um, would this be a, a separate line that has to be put in? like rail tracks? Uh, I do not believe it would be so much like that. When we are making the trolley and making the bicycle lane at the same time, 
after giving the, the ownership on the right of way, I believe that would all happen at one time. It wouldn't be a separate, two separate things. Okay, and then you also have purchased three PCC trolley cars for restoration for $50,000. Is- what about the restoration? Where's that money coming from? That would be, hope with part of this, I think it's half of what we're asking for. I don't understand. Okay, we asked for like 100000 and 50000 would be for that. So that's to purchase and restore the 50000 That's what the estimate is. Okay. How much is it going to cost for the uh, trolleys? Maybe same, different. How much is it going to cost for the trolleys? We think that the purchase of the trolleys and the restoration of the trolleys would be about $50,000. I, I understand that. But what would a trolley cost just to buy it? Gosh, I am not sure, Jill. These are vintage trolleys that were used. Some of them are the same type that were used to go from Springfield to Montreal in the past. Same type of trolley. I am not the expert on the cost of the trolleys. I do know that was looked into and we were told, we were estimated that repurchase and refurbish would be 50,000 for the three. I do not have the figure. I'm afraid I must say that I can probably ask to get it for you, but I do not have it in the back of my head right now. Okay, thank you. I'm done, Bob, thank you. Okay, uh, David? I, I have no questions, Bob, thank you. Juanita? Juanita, you need to I know. Um, I have the same question, Gloria. I'm still confused about the the trolleys uh, and how they were going how they're going to work. Um, are, are these trolleys? Will they have the electrical uh, lines on the top? Are they gas um, trolleys? Are they more like buses? What what are they like? Uh, I have that. I wish I could share the video that that. I have on the desktop here for you. It, the video we have has the one of the lines at the top. Whether that would be the way, I would think not now, probably. You know, I would think the safer thing would probably be one that was gasoline powered. Okay. Well, but you know, what you have that looks and the feels the same as it did before and yet is safe for today may be two different things. Okay, and the only other question is the monies that you that you have down here, the, the grants, uh, Mass DOT, and other grants. Do you have any um, secure um, grants right now? At the moment, we have many n- nice letters coming back, but not a firm something. It is an awful place to be in, but that's what it is. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I have no other questions. Uh, Terry Mitchell, any questions? No questions. Terry Rodriguez, any questions? All right, Uh, Ralph? Yes, Charlie, can you clarify where the trolleys would actually be running? Yes, there there is an old rail line, the Highland rail line, that goes up through the night, comes down, and then would come down, with, with extension, would come down to Union Station. So that's the area that we would use to be able to connect people uh, onto the other PBTA services and perhaps serve the people in that area. At the moment, I hate to say it, but the area for the most part gets used by people dumping and stuff and it's not so nice. But having something there with people riding on the bicycle or people in the trolley, I think would be very good uh, to keep the area nice and safe. How would the bicycles and the trolleys coexist on the same area? You, ha- um, you probably have was there when the mayor showed the uh, works in um, in hmm, Bogota, I believe, and uh, and there they have lines along the side that are posts, and it, you you don't go across those lines, so the bicycles would be in one line, and then the trolley section would be another line. And there'd be very deal difficulty of people uh, getting across those two lines. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Willie Thomas, any questions? Excuse me, Bob. 
I just have a quick question. We do have that video if you want to show like 10 seconds of it. Okay. While you continue. You have it. Go ahead, dear. Okay. Good. This is a trolley coming down the street. Something similar, looking like that vintage. Area by the street is probably where it would be when, when we came into Union Station area. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. So back to Willie, any, any um, questions? No, Willie? No questions. Thank you for the presentation, sir. And, and I guess my only question, Charlie, is what does PCC stand for? Oh, my. It is the name of the car. Oh, okay. I, I can't remember if it stands for Pullman at the end or what, but it's the name of the car. The, um, there's about eight different trolley cars, and one of them is named that. Okay. Very good. So I think just to follow up on um, Gloria's question, if you can get to us um, the cost of purchasing a car and the cost of rehabilitating a car, and then it's times three, and that will help answer her question. If you can... I will ask the person to get that, the people who know, uh, to get that information to you, as the French say, too sweet. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. So, back to Pam Howland for um, reuse wood to rebuild well. Um, can I just ask Charlie another question? Sure. Um, Charlie, yeah. if this is going to run on a line, who owns the line? Yes, that, uh, I. Uh, that was part of what I crossed out here. <laughs> there are about 12 different people that at the moment owns parts of the line. Part and do you, of what we would do would be to purchase the line rights to be able to use those tracks. Okay, thank so that, you. That adds something we wouldn't have had before, but it, it, that is necessary to be able to purchase the usage rights. All right, thank you. All right. So, Pam, are you called in now so we can hear you? So you need to unmute yourself with the phone. I don't know how one does that, but you're muted right now. There, that should do it. Great. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so I'm... So I'm this... Um, this um, what you need to do is is turn off the sound on your computer and only use the phone because otherwise you're getting feedback from the of the on the computer. Put the volume to zero. Okay. There you go. How, how's that? Okay, great. I've never had this problem before, so I'm sorry that I couldn't solve it right away. Um, at any rate, I'm, I appreciate you giving me this leeway to come back to get started on this presentation. Um, what I've discovered is that Springfield has enormous resources that have been, have been shipped off to uh, landfills and, and incinerators. And that is a historic, it's a historic legacy that Springfield can use to a much, to really help to rebuild its communities and to, I mean, its neighborhoods and give a better, um, give a more, you know, complete track for young people coming up who right now their chances of getting employment are thinner and thinner and they've got to learn how to make their own employment um, and so the the idea of reusing wood would combine the great resource of 
the Springfield, the Greater New Life Christian Center. If you all haven't seen it, it's an Indian orchard and it's a beautiful facility for a lot, for pulling together a lot of different kinds of investors, really, um, you know, including students. Um, and in combination with the Youth Social Educational Training Center and Dr. Starnes's work as a teacher, we could have a whole job training program that would be preserving historic wood and also preserving the environment and also building a real community resilience workforce. Um, we're, we have time to pull together um, the details of the program and also repair this other great asset which we have, which is a, um, there are five different highly industri industrial capacity uh, work, woodworking pieces of equipment that we got from the Carpenters Training Center. And those can be restored, they can be tuned up and made available to people, not only students, but also even made available to um, to other contractors who want to finish wood or save wood to sell. Um, so there's, and those contractors would be offering job placement opportunities for students. Um, and we would be able to develop a kind of a, a certification program through Paula's work, Dr. Starnes's work. And we would have a, a real, you know, comprehensive, not only job training center, but also a, a program that serves people from downtown in the South End where where Watershed is and also up in Indian Orchard where Greater New Life is. So it's just an opportunity for us to pull together a lot of resources and create jobs instead of wasting materials. Okay, thank you, Pam. So we'll start with questions. Gloria, any questions? Yes. Um, how many uh, people do you hope to use in the pro to have br bring into the program? Yes, we, Dr. Storms and I had talked about possibly having two cohorts, one for um, students under the age of 18, but the other would be for students over the, or, I mean, learners over the age of 18. And we could, we imagine being able to have 15, individuals a year spend eight to nine months in over the course of a year in the program learning with hands-on and also we would be making use of workforce development training monies to have paid on the job training programs or placements and when they finish the program where could the, where would they find themselves employed ah now this is the great thing this is where contractors come in. There are contractors who, in fact, um, Jackie Simich Norwood just met with uh, one of my one of my partner contractors, um, Royal Renovations, Gerald Glass, uh, just today. And one of the things that he was talking about is the need to have a place where where people can try out, you know. Uh, tools and woodworking to be able to really know that they want to go into carpentry and that they want to be able to do historic preservation, historic reuse old wood. Um, and so they were talking 15 over the course of, of the year. So do you have partnerships with or hope to develop partnerships where someone who's gone through the program has a has a place where they could potentially be employed I can speak yes in fact, yeah go ahead Paula. <laughs> yes um since was it's been a job training program for 17 years we have built partnerships not only in the trades but also in mainstream so this this um training for carpentry isn't going to limit 
them to having to go into the carpenters union or any jobs of that sort. This training overall will get them ready for the workforce in general. So they'll have options. And yes, we have partnerships where we can feed them to other businesses. For example, the African Diaspora is a mental health clinic on State Street. They have interns from Springfield College. They also work with families to help them not only with their social, emotional, and therapeutic needs, but also to get them uh, jobs and employment in the community. So again, we do have partnerships that are already established. Okay. And to add to that, I, I would be looking for young women who would, or older women who would like to restore old windows. So there are a number of, of us contractor and trades people who could place qualified trainees, qualified apprentices. All right, thank you. No more questions. Thank you. David Finn, any questions? Yeah, I had a question similar to Gloria's, and I guess it's, it's more centered around the specific type of training, and does the training educate somebody in how to preserve historic wood, or you know, what types of jobs would this lead to, this training? Yes, I imagine working on historic buildings because those buildings have a lot of just such valuable wood in them a lot of those buildings have been demolished but some buildings are going to we're going to be restoring the um the porch um posts and and balusters and railings and those things that there's a great concern about um you know lead paint and we have the capacity to to de-lead components in a controlled setting that would allow us to reuse those those beautiful architectural parts of those buildings and and hopefully even put them back on the on the um original houses that they came from but even then there are buildings that get torn down that have real two by four um, studs and two by eight um, rafters and floor joists, that material can be, um, it can be milled actually at that shop using these pieces of equipment that, that we have and resold as, you know, finished very valuable um, wood flooring, um tongue and groove or i mean um tongue and groove we could do but we could also do shiplap siding out of out of these old uh structural members of of historic houses that have been torn down um so we're looking to to keep all of the value in the city the value would would stay would recycle back to the residents of Springfield who could be involved in this. But I also feel that it's important for them to know that we're working on OSHA certification, so it goes beyond the carpentry and I'm an anti professor and also a high school English teacher. The skills that they're going to learn, they're going to be ready for the job force. Did you hear? I know my yeah. yep. No, I, I heard you. Okay. David, do you, is that it? you have any other questions? I'm good, thank you, Bob. Bonita? Um, well, first of all, I think this is a wonderful project. It sounds it's just wonderful. But my question oh. is, you, Bob, um, I, I, I mean, maybe this is for another time, but I, I, I'm not sure how it fits, how we can fit it into um, the, uh, the CPA with historic um, preservation. Even though it's not a house, it's not a, a place, it's not a statue. Does that make sense to you, Bob? Well, yes. So, so clearly, this is something that when we get to deliberations, we will have to talk about. Um, so, okay. whether this fits in. All right. Good project, though. Oh, thank you. But I would like to say that we're preserving 
existing porches, existing windows, existing doors, um, and they they would go back to the buildings that are still standing so that we could maybe keep, we could prevent buildings from being torn down. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Thank you. next, Terry Mitchell, any questions? Oh, Terry stepped away. So, Terry Rodriguez, any questions? No questions at this time. It was answered already. All right. Uh, Ralph? Uh, yes, I mean, given that the CP, CP money, CPA money cannot, it's not really for a training program, it's really for actual preservation of historical objects, and generally when historical objects are preserved, we need to attach preservation restrictions on them. How would we attach preservation restrictions on pieces of wood that get reclaimed and sold to other people? It could well, that, that would be when houses were being remodeled or torn down um, so that none of the wood would be wasted from any old porches or any, any um, you know, doors or anything like that that was, uh, was being preserved. But we could also, Ralph, I believe that we could re, um, rebuild the porches with their original material. Okay, thank you. Willie Thomas. Welcome, thank you. Willie Thomas, any questions? Just a couple. The project that you're proposing here, is this based upon an existing project? Is there any other project like that in the area? Or just a totally new concept? Oh, thank you for asking that question. I've spent the last four years wanting to do this. Um, there are programs all over the country um, that are combining reused, reusing building materials with job creation. Um, the model that I focused on was from um, the Baltimore reuse project, where this, the the um, U.S. Forest Service actually initiated this program for job training, but also for saving forests, for, for, you know, saving wood. Um, and that model, we actually have a business plan that um, the city used to, and the, and the Forest Service used um, to design their program and we can use as much of that as in fact their purpose was to help other cities design programs similarly um i also am a part of a national organization called build reuse and we have businesses all over the country who have started out with just little small workshops but they never had the great advantage of why set and and greater new life to to sponsor a whole job creation program. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Terry Mitchell. You back? Do you have any questions, Terry? Terry, you're muted. Do you have any questions? No. All right. So um, thank you, Pam. I guess that that takes care of our our questions. Great. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, Paul. Okay. So the, the next presentation is the McKnight District Common Areas Restoration Project. Who's making the presentation? Yeah. Damien? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I need to know if you, um, this was sent in a little late. It was a... Uh, an open space plan for McKnight. It was an archway. I don't know. Uh, somebody sent that in, and I don't know if you received that in time. Can you confirm if you? Yes. Thank you. All right, we're going to go back to that in a second. Um, the general, we have, I'm going to start my timer. Uh, the general consensus of the residents of McKnight, they're, they're going, they're all, we're all going through anxiety up here. People are living in fear for their lives from the now, uh, what once was random shootings to more shootings on a regular basis. The residents are worried about where the bullet 
the random bullets are going. Nobody knows. Um, as we all know, McKnight is set between two city gang um, organizations. And unfortunately, they like to play havoc within our neighborhood. The residents are also um, very afraid of being hit by speeding cars while they're trying to cross the street uh, or having their homes hit by cars, which has happened. Um, there is a constant uh, presence of dirt bikes and quad runners that are terrorizing our neighborhood. They're running through our parks, Thompson Triangle, and other areas. Um, so basically, they're also, we're going to go back to the common areas because this is going to be what's important. People, they bought houses here. They were sold the false bill of goods when buying the houses here. Now they can't get out because they can't sell their house for any value. Um, they're tired of the boarding houses, the rehab facilities, the fake bed and breakfast endeavors that are going on in our neighborhood, which are just basically rooming houses by the day. Uh, historical houses are being shaken apart. Um, from vibrations, from traffic and heavy truck equipment. Uh, living on a busy street, which I do, and other, many others do, we can't sleep going through the night because of gunfire, sirens, uh, loud exhaust systems, and extremely loud stereo systems. Um, and we're also being plagued by heavy equipment with their jake brakes and their powerful engines to get the trucks removed, moving again. So we are trying to plan a proposal for you that would make McKnight more inviting. Um, we would like to use the uh, firm Goody and Clancy out of Boston to come in and give us some ideas and sketches on St. James Avenue, how to reduce the flow of traffic, or I should say reduce the speed of the flow of traffic throughout the neighborhood and make this a more livable neighborhood for residents to be welcomed into instead of ostracized from. Uh, the open spaces really need to be visited as far as, you know, real street signs that have historic period relevance to them, um, are raised crosswalks that need to be installed to control the flow of traffic, to allow our residents to cross the street safely. Um, there's a lot in these proposals that are going on, and I didn't realize I only have five minutes, so this is a lot of information to get out. So we're looking to get a plan together that would kind of be coexisting with uh, Washington Boulevard when you diverted the traffic, uh, Indian Orchard, Worcester Street when you diverted the traffic there, Bellevue Avenue for the preservation of the neighborhood as well as the houses. Um, in Forest Park Avenue where it says no trucks allowed. Um, we're looking for letters of your support for the city council to start getting very accurate estimates for what this would cost to do um, in a very realistic plan to go forward with bettering the neighborhood. As you know, I've been working on this project for about eight years now without in McKnight. Um, I am getting no personal gain, no personal percentage out of this whatsoever from the money that's coming in. Um, the money would be going to the city treasury and then it would be dispersed from there upon approval of invoices that are submitted. Hey, Damien, um, you've, you've yes. got uh, just about 30, 40 seconds left. All right. So, um, so we did the street stuff. Basically we're looking for the race crosswalks. We're looking for historic signs. We're looking for the Bishop's crooks. Um, by the way, I did go down to the dingle today. There's a lot of water seepage down there. So whichever plan goes forward, that water needs to be tested because it looks like it's running out of the sewer system and people are saying it's natural spring water. But when I went down there, it didn't look like natural spring water was the only thing going through the dingle. So that really needs to be visited closely by whoever gets that project. It's a mess down there and it really needs to be looked at. And if you have any questions, I'll be willing to take them because I know I'm out of time right now. Okay, thank you. So we'll start Gloria. Any questions? Gloria, any questions? No, you're muted, Gloria, still.
Gloria. Oh, now she's frozen. So we'll move on. We'll come back to Gloria. Dave, any questions? Yeah, Damien, I see a, I see a, a total funding request, but I, I don't see a, a breakdown of, of how the money would be utilized. Um, there was a breakdown too. Uh, uh, for project for FY 2020 budget. It was for magazine playground, the Dingle Street Furniture Restoration, raised cobblestone crosswalk, truck study route, uh, Worthington and St. James Avenue, traffic dampening work. Uh, Goody and- oh, my, my apologies to you. My um, apologies. Okay. Anything. Um, again, these are all estimates because we do not have exact figures on this yet because we don't have the funding to have the people come out and actually give us the exact figures. Uh, Goody and Clancy did say for the St. James Avenue corridor, that estimate is right about at the money. It might be a little higher than that. Um, but they said we're pretty much, that 40,000 is pretty much ballpark right there, right on the money. Um, for that open space plan for McKnight, that uh, sketching of the um, building there with the archway, you see that one? I do, yes. Okay, one of the issues for our dry bridge at the end up by Albany Street was the height of the traffic and the weight of the traffic coming down the street. The situation we ran into with the city of Springfield is that their tallest fire truck is 12 feet 6 inches, which is pretty close to the same height as a tractor trailer. So in order to reduce the tractor trailer traffic, we could build an arch on one side of the road, which would be the we would call it the West Gate. That would be the inlet to um, St. James Avenue. And the other side of the street would be left open. So if an emergency vehicle does need to transit the area, even though when I spoke to the fire department, they do realize that all of their fire equipment is too heavy for that bridge and that they do every effort they can to not use that bridge unless there's an extreme emergency. So leaving one side of the road open for access to fire equipment and closing the other side to make it like about 10 feet, six, 11, 11 foot entrance would limit our truck traffic and they would not be able to enter our area as they're, they're using St. James Avenue like it's 291. And that's why we have 291. So they don't have to use our inner streets, but they're using it because it's simply a shortcut and it's vibrating our houses apart. And okay. this is for preservation. We're trying to preserve these houses. We put lots and lots of money and effort. And as you know, these houses are labors of love up here. And it's like, when you buy a house, you basically marry this thing. And it's like, you're constantly fixing something, redoing something. And when the trucks come by, the plaster and horse here walls are just crumbling. And you know, people's ceilings on Worthington Street have fallen in on top of the grand piano. It, it's just been ridiculous. And foundations are cracking. It's, it's just Can you obscene. Question, so, um, David, do you have any other questions? I do not, Bob, thank you. Thank you, Damien. Welcome. Did you have anything? I guess not. Um, Juanita? I, I don't have any questions at this time. Terry Mitchell, any questions? Hi, I was looking to see, was there any um, letters of support from your neighbor, neighborhood? Well, this is, here's one of the of our neighborhood. We have a couple of um, uh, outstanding people in the neighborhood who like try to run our neighborhood. And when people come to complain, they have to be out from ordinance and code by. So they're very frightened to come forward at this point because they're afraid of retaliation code enforcement, which is already happened. Okay. All right. Any questions? No questions at this time. Uh, Ralph Slate, any questions? Ralph? Any sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I guess my question is is going to be, you know, how can you how can you explain a little bit further, like how a traffic study is considered to be like historic preservation? I mean, I understand the, the sort of the tenuous link there, which is, you know, it's in some ways could potentially lead to not having ceilings fall in on a, on a building because of a traffic route. But uh, the CPC, the CPA is generally for actual physical work. So can you explain how those two things are related? 
Um, the, the traffic study, we, we all know there has to be some formalities in this process. The traffic study is just a formality to reinforce how bad the traffic is through the neighborhood. You're, you're talking about a historic neighborhood. We're talking about a historic neighborhood, which nobody wants to move into. At the first opportunity, people are jumping ship out of McKnight because they don't want to be here anymore. So the traffic study, to me, is just a formality, and it doesn't, it's really not functional. Anybody who comes up here does not want to live up here because of the noise, the speed of the traffic, the ridiculousness of the driving, the car accidents. I mean, all you have to do is look at the car accidents that happen every week up here, and you just be astounded. Oh, it, one car just ended up in Roberta Kenny's front yard. You know, another car ended up on her front porch. Another car ended up in my front yard. Another a cruiser ended up on Dartmouth Terrace because he crashed on Dartmouth Terrace, a cruiser. You know, so to me, there shouldn't even be a traffic study. There should just be action taken at this point. And we've gone forward with the truck route and we went as far as Secretary Pollack out in Boston to have these issues addressed. But they keep seem to getting to be getting suppressed because Springfield seems to be profiting off of poverty, not off of hardworking people. They're profiting off of poverty. They're not respecting our historic district at all. And they're just like stepping all over us, like we're nothing and that we don't count. When projects can be done in other parts of the city that <clears throat> people's friends live in to do traffic dampening, such as Indian Orchard, Bellevue Avenue, Forest Park Avenue, Washington Boulevard, we don't have a problem with doing projects there, but when it comes to McKnight in our district, you know, we're, we're pretty much discriminated against by the city of Springfield. So we're looking for a letter of support so we can go forward to the council members. And some of the council members have been called, uh, have had to recuse themselves lately because we've elected these people to represent us at city hall, but city hall in the city council has turned around and said it's a conflict of interest to have a representative from our district speak for us at city council, which I think is totally ridiculous. We elected these people to stand up for us, to fight for our rights with city council, and then they can't present and or vote on anything? What's wrong with that picture? Do you understand what I'm saying? So Ralph, are you all set? Or you have more questions? I think I'm all set, thank you. Will I'll play questions, Ralph. Willie, any questions? Nope. No questions. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thank you, Damien. Um, Thanks, Bob. Moving Bob. on. Yeah. Oh, Gloria, you finally got in. Yes. I don't know what happened, but Hi, anyway, Gloria. I apologize. I just, I'm looking at the project uh, budget. Yes. Magazine playground, <clears throat> excuse me, initial improvements, $200,000. Right. Okay. I would like to see a further breakdown of the whole budget. So I understand what $200,000 is going for. Okay. But well, the dingle, uh, 50,000. What's going to happen in the dingle for $50,000? We may have bigger. Okay. Let's start with magazine playground. All right, so Magazine Playground um, is basically named off of Henry Knox and George Washington. And okay. it, I'm yeah. sorry? Let me stop you there. What would probably be helpful is for you to get the committee additional information that breaks down so it answers Gloria's you know, question. So for example, if you're planning a spray pad at at magazine playground that has a particular cost if you're talking about upgrading the baseball field that will have a specific cost so rather than telling us now when we're not going to remember it'd be better to get us a piece of paper that is an addendum and a, you know an expansion of this budget that further breaks down these various items okay so, uh so can you put that on the table until I can get you a breakdown? Oh, yeah. I mean, so what I'm going to say is if you can get us something by, I'm going to say, June 20th. I will work on that. Um, you can email it to cpc at springfieldcityhall.com. Um, 
and we start deliberations on the 25th. So it's best that we have it about a week before we start deliberations. Right, um, and she, ha she had, I've got one statement and then one question. She um, asked me the issue about the $50,000 on the dingle. Um, I took a walk down there today and I feel we have more problems than what you can imagine down at that dingle with maybe sewer lines leaking into the dingle area, like street sewers um, and the sewage system from the houses. There's a pretty good amount of water that's uh, flowing down to that area. And somebody said that that was from a spring and I just can't believe that to be true. All that water's coming from there. And it, it looks pretty uh, sketchy and it should be tested regardless who this plan goes through to redo the dingle, whether it goes to you know the rail trail through McKnight Neighborhood Council or if it goes through us, um, something has got to be addressed with that. $50,000 is um, a proposal to get a landscape architect in there <clears throat> to give us the scope of the work that needs to be done. Again, there were concerns about you know people and finances and things like that. That's why I was making it very clear that this money would get deposited into the city treasurer's fund it would not be released until we we had invoices to release those funds to pay those bills. And any money that would not be used would be returned. Um, my, my, that would be my statement. So the money would be basically secure and whatever gets done from that $50,000, everything would be receipted and above board. One of my questions was gonna be through the, um, do we have, time at the end of the meeting to address any comments or questions to the first presenter? We, we do not. We you do have, not? No, no, no. We, we, we do not. You have the ability to send us written comments, either by mail or by email. Um, but at this point, we, you know, we're not taking comments tonight because we had asked people to sign up ahead of time if they want okay thank you you're welcome thank you all right so um, moving on preservation revolving fund oh, was that David Gaby David are you speaking on behalf of this uh, David you have to unmute yourself somehow Karen, can you tell David how he has to unmute himself if he's on the phone? All right, David, you're unmuted. I'm unmuted? Yes. Very good. So your five minutes has begun. Okay, uh, we are proposing in light of our discussions at the last, after the last, um, our, our previous proposal um, for, for a, a general fund to, propose, to uh, carry out restoration projects, we're now proposing that uh, a fund of $200,000 be provided for specific properties that we've identified and that um, these properties fall into essentially two groups. Um, the first, per, first set of properties, which I, I think I've sent uh, illustrated outlines, the first set of properties would be um, properties where there's serious deterioration that is impairing the um, stability, livability, code, code compliance, and so forth of the, uh, of the properties. And uh, as, a, as an alternative to um, abandoning those properties in some cases. And the second group is um, properties, and these are, I have emphasized throughout the McKnight District, that um, have had unfortunate renovations done in the past and are not no longer contributing to the historic, the, uh, the way we would like to, and like them to anyway, to the, to the overall architectural integrity of the district. Um, we're 
proposing to operate this through a, a committee that we've set up, a revolving fund committee, which would include a wide variety of people in the community, including um, a, a number of people who have construction and and um, and historic preservation experience. One of the things that we've found is that our local contractors um, are oftentimes are not being utilized, and in, in addition, they oftentimes do not have the expertise to um, do historic preservation or proper historic preservation. So we're including within the program a, uh, a training and certification process so that contractors that are engaged know what the secretary's standards for historic preservation are and specifically for renovation and preservation. And um, in addition to that, we um, because it's a revolving fund, we are tapping volunteers and, and um, professionals in the community to assist in underwriting properties so that we make sure that the uh, funds that are lent are um, uh, secured by secured by real estate and we have a minim we minimize the chance of loss of uh, loss of principal one of our one of our goals is that funds instead of being more to more or less expensed as grants as happens in the past or has happened many times in the past and results in um, the situation we have now where there are properties that need to be restored but we don't have any available resources and we constantly hear from city officials we only have funds for demolition this has been the excuse with um, for instance 69 Bowden Street for instance um, 71 Thompson Street many of the historic houses have been demolished we've, we've heard that oh we only have funds for demolition we'd like to see their their resources to fund restoration when it needs to be done um, in addition we are proposing that properties that are outside the quote local district be uh, subjected to a preservation restriction that um, would essentially mean that their history their they would be regulated by the historical commission subsequent to uh, improvements in addition to that um, we've proposed a small amount of money to revive the millwork program that we formerly ran with the mcknight between the mcknight neighborhood council and the um, city of springfield Code community development department where we assisted people with millwork that um, is specialty um specialty custom mill work that needs to be made up basically based on models for for the for each building um and uh, we would propose to assist uh properties with that now as far as financial management we are proposing that um funds be held by the city that any repayment goes to the city and that um, any um, um, specific services that are, that are to be provided, for instance, construction or any other services like specification writing would be invoiced and paid after approval by city council. Um, hey, David, not to interrupt, uh, but your time is just about up. Okay, I think that uh, I, I'd just like to say we have not had an opportunity to review that general overall um, operating idea with the council, but we would uh, look forward to talking with uh, the law department and the city council about how to make um, this compliant with everyone's ideas. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll start with questions. Uh, Gloria, any questions? Yes, David, are these houses like 20 Buck Buckingham Street um, already occupied um, in general speak generally speaking yes specifically 20 Buckingham is occupied and has a um, highly problematic front porch okay and how are you going to vet the people who are going to get this revolving loan 
in terms of credit or in terms of well, of uh, underwriting standards? On are, how are they going to be assessed so that they are they will be able to repay this loan? We are going to be loaning this uh, to be um, annually annually certified. If they can afford a repayment, they will be making a payment based on standard standard um, twenty nine thirty five percent of income. If they cannot afford the payment, the, the uh, loan will accrue at a zero percent interest rate, but be be um, indexed for inflation, so that. The, uh, a dollar lent today would be worth a dollar when we collect it, whenever we collect it. But if the property is sold outside the family, the loan would have to be repaid at that point. We are proposing that we have a, a standard loan to value ratio, a maximum, a maximum amount of total debt on the property of 80% uh, loan to value. And that um, if there's a critical situation of, relative to uh, a property where there's a, let's say a high balance of the mortgage, uh, we are proposing to work with the code enforcement department and the housing court to see if we can get um, existing mortgages to subordinate so that they don't end up losing more value than on the property than they, uh, than they would through the improvement law. Okay. And have you talked to anybody in the city about setting up some type of a, a revolving loan? I have, re wait a minute. I have personally spoken to people in the past. Um, I have sent a memo to the law department and have not received a response. I have spoken to um, people who are running revolving funds around the country, specifically through the National Trust and in, in a very successful program in Providence, Rhode Island. But uh, our city of Springfield, no, I have not spoken to them. I would okay. love to have them call me, have, have a response. Thank you. No more, Bob. Okay, um, David, any questions? Yes, just, uh, just one. David. Who determines who gets hired to do the work? Um, we were, we are appointed, created and appointed and started recruiting people for a contracting committee. Um, we would anticipate that the, um, <clears throat> among those people who are certifi certified, we would not entertain anyone who has not demonstrated a familiarity with the secretary's standards. Other than that, it would have to be the uh, selection of the homeowners. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, Juanita, any questions? Uh, no, I don't have any questions at this time. Right. Terry Mitchell. No questions. Terry Rodriguez. No questions at this time. Hey, Ralph. Yes, David. Um, do you have Do you have a way that you could potentially um, pare this down a little bit? I mean, there are you know five properties, or actually, there's more. There's quite a few properties on this list. Um, is there a way to to something that could be a little bit more exper experimental that we could uh, do one property at first to see how that goes? I think that would be very, very possible, one or two properties. Okay, thank you. Okay. Willie Thomas, any questions? <clears throat> Willie, any questions? <laughs> no, I guess not. All right. Well, thank you, David. Okay. So thank the, you. Uh, the next question, the next pre presentation is the model mixed income affordable ownership housing project. Who is speaking on that? I was supposed to help uh, Dr. Ali. Is he on the on the meeting? 
We don't see him there, although there was an unidentified phone number somewhere. I can cover it quickly if you'd like. Um, well, um, as opposed to not having a presentation, better we should have something. All right. Okay. Um, the open housing, with my help, is proposing to uh, start institutionalization or, or um, operation of a mixed income housing cooperative as a as a program which can be expanded throughout throughout the McKnight and throughout the city as a potential dis, potential substitute for the present uh, rental rental housing for of uh, assisted housing for families in the uh, proposal we have three units uh, which are all on Bay Street and the essence of that is that um, one is almost finished or, or one building with, with two units is almost finished it's the house that we moved um go ahead hello oh you're still there david continue talking okay all right the house that we the, what we call the dodge howard house uh, which is now located at 111 bay street and uh, another house at 172 bay street would form the beginning of a deed restricted permanently affordable housing development aimed at uh, a f lower income families. This, the legal structure of it would be such that it could be expanded so that, um, for instance, if two family houses become available uh, or apartment buildings become available, they can be added so that instead of subsidizing uh, investors in other places like New Jersey and New York and Boston, to uh, own ho own housing for a period of time and then have to be re-subsidized with another set of uh, Section 8 or um, other public funding to make it affordable for another period of time, like another 15-year stint. This would stay affordable permanently and would be a stock of um, housing that would be accessible to um, Lower and, lower and moderate income families in the future, permanently. The um, particular f uh, CPA funds that are being requested essentially are to assist with the um, energy efficiency measures in both buildings. Um, and both would be subject to the deed restriction that uh, was approved by the McKnight neighborhood uh, in the 1990s. Um, and Dr. Ali had a lot of other things that he wanted to say about the city's housing policies and the need to to prevent dis, dis, so much displacement that's been happening with code enforcement, but I'm not prepared with that this afternoon. Okay, well, well, thank you for pitching in. So uh, we're going to do questions. We understand that we may have some issues, you know, it may be Dr. Ali We'll have to answer them at some point. So we'll start with Gloria. Any questions? Gloria, you're now muted again. Okay, sorry, sorry. My my computer's acting up again. Uh, I, my question, and I, um, I think it's really um, going to be on Dr. Uh, Ali to answer them, it, are regarding the budget. For it says the McKnight pilot program a uh, project at uh, Bay Street, uh, 111 and 113, total cost including energy retrofit $425,000. Um, what's that include? I just would need a breakdown of everything, um, so I would have a, a an understanding of where our money is going. It's nothing. I don't think it's something that can be done today, but should be submitted to us. That can I can have him get that to you. Thank you. That's it. All right, um, David Finn. Yeah, uh, David, you, you said that the CPA request was primarily for energy energy uh, 
retrofits. Can you just speak a bit more specifically to what that entails? Yes. Um, the um, energy, the, 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 essentially both houses have been insulated up to the, what we, I think of as the 1970s standards with blown in fiberglass um, and, and rock wool. And the um, proposal is to add additional insulation and, and uh, ceiling to um, both buildings um, so that they're so that um, they're meeting more modern standards. Um, and I can I can pro provide a exemplary um, proposal that, uh, that details all the insulation and um, there's also I believe interior window treatments of um, preserving the existing sash but adding uh, an interior panel. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yes, I, I have some questions. I mean, first of all, I think that the application is incomplete. There's a lot missing. Also, the summary, I think, belongs to another application, not this one. It talks about the common areas, improved park and street. Oh. I think it was the one, the last one, or the one Phillips Street. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's I incomplete. I mean, there's so, there's so much missing in here. Anyway, you could relay that to, to uh, Mr. Ali. I will relay that. Okay. Okay, um, Terry Mitchell. Okay. Well, Terry Mitchell. Terry Rodriguez, any questions? No questions at this time. Okay, Ralph, any questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. So, David, you mentioned that the, the money that would be uh, used for for this project would be primarily in the form of energy uh, energy efficiency upgrades. And I do understand right. that you know tangentially that that is related in some ways to the idea of preservation in that it makes the property uh, potentially more attractive. But is there a, is there maybe a less tenuous uh, a, a set of items in your budget and more concrete that the money could be de designed to, to fit. So for example, when I look at the program budget, you know, there's a, there's a $25,000 line item that says for providing information to neighbors around Springfield. I mean, that may not be an allowable CPA expense because it's not really going to bricks and mortar. It's sort of an education program. Um, and you know, you have a $425,000 line item for 111, 113 Bay street, but you know, is there, so I guess my question is, is there a way to be more specific in asking for something that is uh, very concrete and historic in nature versus energy efficiency? Because I find the energy efficiency to be a little bit of a harder sell. I can look, I can have them look at that. Um, I, I have to say that the, uh, a lot of the hard historic preservation things uh, like the house, including the house moving, have already been um, committed. But um, I will have the, I will get back. Um, I'm, there's a pardon me. I'm, I'm watching the screen, and there seems to be a dis uh, un, lack of syn synchronization between this audio and video. Um, I can look at that. So David um, and respond. June twentieth would be the time that we want all the information that's being asked for. That'll be fine. Okay. I'm sure. Ralph, any other problems? Um, no, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Willie Thomas. Any questions, Willie? No, I guess not. So, David, I guess my question is, um, I know that 111, 113 Bay is still empty. Is 172 also an empty house at this point in time? No, it, no, it is not. No, it's it's been uh, was restored in this in the 80s and is still occupied. We we're attempting to keep it keep it affordable out of the speculative market. 
So, so this project is both a combination of getting, <clears throat> let's call it new owners into vacant units and keeping existing income eligible owners in their own units. Not only the existing income eligible owners, but also seeing preparing for that when we get a new owner that we have um, housing that's available without um, a cost speculative cost penalty. What's happening is um, so much of the housing that's coming available is very expensive that we're pricing people out of the market. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you. Um, moving on, the next presentation is Trinity House Women in Crisis Shelter. Hello. 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 Can you guys hear me? It's Lisa Goodman. Yes, and you have five minutes. Um, I wonder why I'm not on the screen, because I can see you guys. And I was on earlier, and now I'm not, because I'm also on my phone, because well, I logged into the Zoom. I can certainly see you. We can, okay. see, we can see you, and we can hear you in two different places. OK, I want to make, OK, so should I mute my phone? So you can hear me on my laptop, but hopefully I'll mute my phone so it's not crazy or should I do my computer because I had a hard time getting in you sound very so, good fine. leave what you have you sound good okay if you okay, if you great. can if we can hear you and mute your cell phone it would be great to see you as well but I'm not sure if that's okay possible. let's try that I'm going to mute the cell phone and I'm going to talk into the laptop and hopefully it's on my volume and everything is on and I'm not muted on my laptop hang on And now we can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Go back to the way you were. <laughs> can't hear you. So it's something crazy. Yeah, just, okay. So it's working fine. It's something, okay. So I know it's crazy going on, but I'm glad everybody's well. I know I have five minutes, so I'm going to make this very quick. Uh, we'd like to introduce to you an exciting new city initiative, which is going to uh, the Trinity House uh, Women in Crises Emergency Shelter Project. And I am Lisa Goodman. I have over 20 years experience in community development and urban and youth development in the city of Springfield. I absolutely love Springfield. and. Um, this is really an important, important project that we're proposing to the CPA. This house at 5153 Bay Street that we are looking to rehab uh, for the community preservation is, is in terrible dilapidated shape right now. It has some strong structures on the inside as far as the heating unit and stuff like that, but it's been an eyesore in the city of Springfield for over 20 years. It is owned by Holy Trinity Church it has not been occupied in over 20 years. Um, the, you can see all the pictures that are in the project, in the proposal. And we are proposing to rehab this facility and put a emergency shelter in there for women in transition and small children. Due to the COVID-19, we know there's going to be a lot of that going on. There's a lot of anxiety up, a lot of stress up. And a lot of people, a lot of abuse too, unfortunately, is going on now due to the stay at home orders. After the COVID-19, um, we don't know when it's gonna be over, but we do know people will be displaced and in transition and in need of housing. So this is a great opportunity for us to rehab this house. We have been attempting, I am the assistant chairman of the project, our chairman, uh, former commissioner George Bruce is recovering from COVID himself now. So we are had started on the project. We've already begun to fundraise for it. And we are request proposing that the CPA fund help us with this project. This building now is currently only assessed at $50,000. And it has the potential to go to $200,000. And if you see the comps in the proposal that are on that are along with this, health it just is embarrassing i mean we need to really get this fixed up they got the new cvs they've renovated all that portion of state street which looks great we're happy to see that when we come out of church we see that it is 
uh, beautiful, it's fixed up, and that's the only eyesore that's left, and we need to not just use that. We have people that are actually come into the church that are homeless people, that are tra people in transition that we would like to help. So we are committed to half of this budget, and we are requesting and proposing that we can get uh, some funding to start rehabbing the, um, for the initial uh, structure to be rehabbed. And there's a picture of it, what it once looked like in its glory and its beauty in the proposal, which was, it was a beautiful structure at one time. And then if you see it now, if you look, take a look at the pictures at what it looks like now, and it has been looking like that for 20 years, um, it's uh, definitely a, I think, well-worthy project to do. It also uh, affects other values in the community of the homes and the comps. You can see those are like three times the amount of this house, which has had so much potential. It was once a beautiful brick structure. Uh, the brick structure is actually very strong. It's not a whole lot that really needs to be done to the outside because uh, we did have the, uh, you know, the Historic Commission, uh, one of the gentlemen came out, took a look at it. We did get, uh, we do have a detailed estimate, a detailed budget of rehab in there, uh, of what it would take for us to get this going. And we also, um, like I said, I've been doing projects like this in the city of Springfield for over 20, 30 years. And we do have other shelters, but the emergency shelter placements are very, very needed in the city of Springfield and exclusively for women, especially battered women or displaced women, not just regular um, homeless shelters, but exclusively that cater to women and children so that the women are not separated from their children is really important. So we are committed to this project, and we do have a, uh, quite a bit on board that are willing to submit. We're just re proposing half of the budget because most of the renovation, you can see the building and the pictures, if you're looking at the proposal, is all boarded up, but most of the renovation is on the inside. I did have pictures of the inside, but I didn't include them in the proposal. Um, because that's where most of the work is to begin because I did include that estimate from the construction company that is uh, detailed all the way from A to Z as to what needs to be done on the inside to make this a successful project. Hey, so, my five minutes is up. Yes. <laughs> Am I done? Good timing. Okay. Thank you. So questions, we'll start with Gloria. Yes. Yep. Any questions? Do you own the house now? We own the house, the church of uh, right next door, Holy Trinity. We own the house and we have owned this house from since 19, uh, it's on a card, I think 1986. Holy Trinity purchased this property and has owned it ever since. No one has ever owned it since then. It was occupied for the first 10 years and it's been vacant for 20. Okay. So it's really, we, we, yeah, we've had people in there, uh, fam, you know, family and stuff, uh, and different parishioners that had uh, lived in the, in the property. It was a beautiful house, and it's just, you know, it's just sitting there like, it, it's, it's awful. CVS looks great. Everything looks so beautifully rehabbed there. And it's a shame to just let it sit there. It's a strong structure, brick-wise, you know, and even the plumbing still is good the the heating stuff is there stuff that can be done we just want to get it opened up so that we can help people in our community There's, we we have come out of church and there are literally homeless people constantly asking us for stuff that make it, we know how the hill mcknight area is that's no secret but we want to do a double impact in the community to help some of these people and to also beautify the community raise property values and we believe that it is a win-win situation if we can get the proposed funding that we are looking for to start. All right, so Gloria, you have to rehab. I'm done, thank you. Um, okay. Did you thin? Hey, Lisa, I noticed in your uh, submitted estimate, um, mm -hmm. did you choose this contractor because they were a, a low-cost provider or were there other reasons that you chose to submit the estimate from them? Um, they actually did the best. I did three of them <laughs> uh, because I am used to doing projects to this nature. 
and I actually got three re, um, three proposals. I had one that was cheaper because I'm really usually extremely frugal, but sometimes the being extremely cheap is not the best. So I went through three companies, and this one was the most thorough, with which came in with the best numbers for the best work, and their reputation was very quality. So we, um, we the board members voted on this one. David, any other questions? You're muted right now. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lisa. Sure. Lisa, any questions? I don't know. I, um, well, I had the same, just to piggyback on David's, I, I wanted to know mm -hmm. if you had, had estimates from other people. Um, I certainly and, did. And, and the things like when you said the outside structure is stable, you've had people look at that and tell you that? Uh, we actually have. We have been, believe it or not, they, uh, George Bruce had started working on this project probably about 10 years ago. <laughs> so we constantly have people coming out. And when I came on board with the project, I'm like, look, we got to get this done. So I had four different contractors actually come to the facility, check out the bricks, check out the plumbing, check out the heat, uh, go floor to floor inside. Uh, with flashlights through every nick and corner of that building before, and I got them proposals before we went with putting this one in the package. Okay. Looks like you did your homework. Yeah, I'm like that. I'm cheap. I do that. I would do it like I would run my own house. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, Terry Mitchell? No. Terry Mitchell, I think it's gone. Okay. Terry Rodriguez. Yeah, Lisa, about how many people yeah. are going to be able to house in there? Well, I, I, as I mentioned into the plan, we're looking at at least housing 10 adults. And also, with if there's small children, then we can do up to 15. Because okay. generally, we look at a person only having mm -hmm. one to two children, and they have to be within a certain age group, small children. Okay. So within the breakdown, if you look at the digital... We did a virtual uh, proposal, which this company put together very nicely of what the place would look like once it's rehabbed from the inside, how many bedrooms it would hold, what the office space was, and how many people we should be able to get into the program. All right, so um, and how long do they have to transition out? Well, that is, um, we're looking at, that really depends on the person's situation because we generally try to do like a year of transition. Some people only need five months, some people need two months, some people need six months, but we're looking at the max of a year for the turnover for transition. And we do have uh, supportive programs that we are already have been collaborating with. We've been working a net of collaborations with CHD, with different schools, different trainings, with also the YMCA, we're trying to make sure that we have a support system of, uh, for these people. We have training programs to send them to, and we also have enough help to get them transitioned in the program and actually out of the program. If you look in the proposal, I did a same type of house about 10 year, 15 years ago, the Deborah House. It's ran for 15 years. That was grassroots. I wrote the proposal, founded that. That is also in the uh, proposal and unfortunately that house just closed mm -hmm. so but it ran for 15 years and it was extremely successful and it was uh, very helpful to a lot of families who are still doing well who transitioned out and are still grateful uh, for the house so I think it's really important thank you, thank you. that's all I needed uh, well. okay Oh yes, Lisa. This sounds like a like a great a great proposal and idea. I do have some concerns though. You know, with the historic okay. one of the boxes that were checked is for historic preservation, and mm -hmm. the way that the CPA works is that all work under historic preservation must be done to the Secretary of the Interior standards. And in reading yeah. sort of the narrative that you presented to the Historical Commission, which was to replace windows and doors, that would not fall under the historic or under the secretary of the interior standards so that it wouldn't really qualify as a project and it also so, sort of sounds like it's a gut rehab and i don't think gut rehabs 
qualify under the Secretary of the Interior standards because they want to preserve the historic material within the building. So what about, so with any other outside structure that we would have to do, would that also, would that be considered something that would qualify if we got a, I don't know, what we, what would we need to do for that to show any more details for the outside structure? Uh, well, maybe a question that's maybe a question for for Bob. Um, okay. it, you know, again, again, I know that you know again the the basic requirement is that the renovation work must comply with the Secretary of Standards. You know, the way that you're yeah. sort of proposing this is that a lot of the work is going to be on the interior. Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm just trying to figure out you know, and I'm not I'm not necessarily opposed to this. I'm just trying to figure out how this could potentially work in a way that would preserve the historic materials of of the structure. Right. You, the money would go to preserve the historic because you know I think that would, what I wouldn't like to see would be the money going to rip out the historic structure interior mm -hmm. to do the gut rehab because it wouldn't seem like that would be in the spirit of the CPA. Right, but we're looking at coming up with a half that's going to propose most of the interior rehab. If you okay. look at the budget that we have, we're looking at working right. to do that ourselves as much. With, with the 124,000, which we have proposed for half, that would go to the structure of making that building really look wonderful the way it used to. If you're looking at okay. the pictures, I'm sure, I, I don't may not have had enough time to research those standards because I did think about that when I was looking at it, but we unfortunately, during this COVID-19 and me submitting that, I lost both my parents. Oh. Uh, May 1st, yes, in the process, and then our chairman got it, then my sister and everybody. I was very challenged with uh, putting this proposal together and finishing it because we worked so hard on it, and I did not want to let the team down. So we are looking at, like I said, being committed to half that budget of the renovation on the inside, and I can actually put together a more um, specific budget for the external renovations that need to be done. I mean, I'm not a builder myself personally, but if you take a look at those pictures from the outside, I'm sure there's more than doors and windows <laughs> that need to be done to this structure. So, I mean, it's roofing, you know, there's some other things that need to be done. It's chimney and roofing, but like I said, I just was interrupted by so much uh, due to COVID-19 and finishing this proposal and making the deadline that I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't let our team down or our chairman down who has been working so hard. And I would be happy to submit a further budget on the external uh, structure of what needs to be done. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, I can submit it to the email because I can also have a Mason come out. That's one thing that we haven't done. We haven't had a Mason actually come out and, che and check the brick, um, you know, the exterior as far as it being uh, on paper. So I can um, definitely um, have a Mason come out and give us an estimate and also have everything checked the chimney and everything like that and have it set as an exclusive budget uh, of what that those repairs would be and submit it through the email. Thanks. By June 20th. Okay. So, uh, Willie Thomas, any questions? Don't know where Willie is. So, um, I guess. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. We, well, we, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, Lisa, that's a very good proposal. I'm glad to see that you got the church and the community involved and in giving you support on the funding of this particular project. Um, I heard the concerns that were expressed by my colleague, and um, I'm sure that we'll work with you to see that the information that we require to make that pro this project qualify is given to you so that we can take a hard look at it and make decisions oh, as to awesome. whether we could fund this. So, so far, good work. Oh, thank you so much. All right. so, thank you so much for having me. So I have a couple of questions. In your budget, I did not mm -hmm. spend money for electric. Is that meaning the electric service is fine and you don't have to spend any money on that? 
or is that um no no there is electric in the budget you didn't see that no nope. it's it's in there <laughs> So, Unfortunately, it would be great to not spend money, but of course, no, there's electric is in there. So, let me just, so the, I have a two page budget. The first mm -hmm. page starts with sub four, and the second page starts with electrical. I'm, I'm sorry, electrical is on the third page. Is on what? It's, the electrical is on the third page of the budget, and it is actually interrupted by an insert that I put in there. I'm sorry that that's stapled in that piece, but there's three pages of the budget. Okay. I on see. that estimate, there's three pages of that estimate. Electrical is on the third page. It's the, the last one. Okay. And, and I guess the other question is, is, have you spoken to either the building department as to whether now that this is going to be a shelter rather than a two-family house that that will bring in elevated fire safety requirements i just suggest that you know if you haven't you might want to do that because you may find that you may need alarms or sprinklers even that has been required in some group homes that have come into mcknight so better you should be forward yes. with that um, yes, I did actually call and inquire about that, but that is something that I can also get an estimate for. That's no problem. And I'm sure that would probably definitely be required, a sprinkler system. Okay. But I will definitely check to make sure. I am pretty familiar with some of these things. I was a former assistant assessor analyst for the city of Springfield. So I did give the building department a call, but like I said, in the midst of so much of get, gathering my information, things were shut down, you know, due to COVID-19. And then I had my own family situation and then our chairman. So a lot of the information that I needed, I'm really usually much more thorough in putting together a proposal. So I do apologize for what is missing and I'm definitely will get that to you. All right, thank you, June 20th. All right, thank you so much. So the last presentation is the class. I know. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys, for having me. Everybody stay well. And I will, should I just go ahead and submit that to CPA um, at SpringfieldCityHall.com? Yes. Okay, I'll have that for you. And June 20th is the deadline for that. So I'll get working on that tomorrow, gentlemen and okay. ladies. Thank you so much. Everybody stay well. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. So the classical folks, who's starting off the presentation? Uh, I, I will. Jeff Gurney. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm joined by Ron LeBaron, the uh, board of president, and uh, my company, Atrium Property Services, was recently hired on uh, uh, several months ago and one of the needs that we saw was uh, the exterior of the uh, of the property and they have uh, put a lot of capital into the interior and some to the exterior but they are uh, at a point where they need uh, certainly financial help to meet the needs uh, that they have on the exterior so uh, the classical high facade restoration program uh, in our opinion, meets many of the CPC's priorities uh, and seemingly all of the general criteria for the preferred application. Uh, several of the building envelope components are deteriorating and the circa 1897 structure in the lower Maple Local Historic District calls for the assistance of the CPC funding so that the needed monies to pay the re for restoration can catch up with the priority work needed at the exterior of 235 State Street. Uh, the priority capital work is envisioned to start, uh, if possible, everything certainly is being pushed back these days, but in the fall of 2020 uh, with masonry work and, and in the late spring of 2021 uh, with carpentry and painting work. The uh, first restoration component is uh, 
painting of 360 windows on three sides of the buildings, of the building, excuse me. Uh, and the fourth, which is the west side of the building, has already been done a couple of years ago by the Condominium Association. The second component is uh, masonry restoration and other cementitious surfaces that need grouting, purging, like kind replacement of brickwork uh, and other masonry surfaces. The estimated cost uh, total uh, for the 2020-2021 project uh, would be about $150,000, of which the trustees seek $120,000 in community preservation funds. The, uh, at this time, and we, we were formulating an application uh, really at the very end of March, and so uh, we did have a chance to put together some estimates, both verbal and in writing. Some of those are presented in the initial application. The uh, contractors that we're working with and the direction of the Board of Trustees at this time is to exclusively work with Springfield contractors. They think that that will certainly benefit the community and uh, certainly complement uh, the application. Uh, so the contractors to date uh, uh, have been all Springfield-based uh, contractors. We're certainly committed uh, to have all the work uh, with same kind of materials and in compliance with federal standards for such historical uh, restoration, which has been mentioned several times this evening as the Secretary of Interior Standards. Uh, I do wish to assure the committee that my company has volunteered our services to clerk the restoration and uh, we're uh, 25 years uh, in this particular business and I have about 35 years of experience in both historical renovation. Uh, I am a certified rehabilitation specialist. I'm a construction supervisor here in Massachusetts and hold construction licenses in both Rhode Island and Connecticut. So we think that's a nice compliment in leveraging uh, that as well do not have to fund uh, clerk services and some of the specifications and other things to meet the standards that I know that the city would want uh, can be enjoyed by our company as well. The um, last item I, I wish to mention is that uh, sort of in closing, and so I can give uh, hopefully Ron LeBaron a little time to speak, is that uh, I wanted to kind of talk about the benefits and that I would want to state that not only does the restoration maintain the historic and architectural value of this landmark building for the benefit of the city, it also serves to benefit the 111 homeowners that, uh, that live there, and uh, it preserves the building as a civic gathering place for public events, which they have had many, and they have a very large atrium hall at the, at the property, if you're familiar with it, and uh, the classical high museum is also uh, in that facility. Uh, visited by many former classical uh, high school uh, members and, and others. And uh, lastly, uh, the public has been welcomed many times for civic events uh, and award uh, settings as well. Uh, the a group called the Cla Historic Classical, excuse, excuse me, Historic Classical has given many tours of the property as well. So we think there's a tremendous benefit to securing funds that would uh, allow the, uh, all those community events to be complemented uh, by the exterior envelope of the building being brought up to uh, a standard as the inside is. And uh, they have a window of opportunity here in the next couple of years to do that and to make it about replacement by repair instead of wholesale replacements and that window of opportunity uh, uh, would be well served uh, by the assistance of the uh, community preservation funding. So thank you. Time, thank you. Want... Your time is just about up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so questions. So Gloria, any questions? No questions. All right, Juanita, any questions? No, I don't have any questions. Uh, Terry Mitchell. Oh, no, Terry Mitchell. Terry Rodriguez. Uh, Terry Rodriguez is gone. Ralph Slate. Any questions? No, uh, all of my concerns were addressed. Uh, Willie Thomas. Any questions, Willie?
Yeah, well, 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 now you're muted again, Willie. You were unmuted for a second. Muted right. it now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, been having trouble with these buttons all evening. Um, no questions. Oh, okay. Um, I guess my only question is, is um, at least that I did not see a quote from Masonry. Is the Masonry the remainder of the $18,000? Uh, that is correct. Yeah, and that we received two verbal quotes. We've worked with two Springfield contractors, both Maggie Masonry and Jolliker Masonry. And uh, for the time of the submission of the initial application, we were unable to secure a very specific what what the work and the content is. It shows somewhat in the pictures that we presented. Is it's uh, a wide, uh, a great amount of small areas to work on of joints and replacements brick replacements as well as coping uh, so it's it's a uh, quite a uh, project to be able to pull together the specifics of that and that will take some time and opportunity but uh, we certainly can do that in the near future well so i guess the question is is can you get us something that deals with the masonry with quote by june 20th oh no question. Absolutely. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our um, presentation um, by nine of the presenters. Uh, we've now completed all of the presenters, uh, all 25 of them. Um, if I remember correctly, Karen, no one has signed up for the public comment period. That is correct. Uh, we have no verbal public comments written comments are um can be submitted um by june 5 and i'm going to actually suggest that since we know that we're not meeting until the 25th that we extend public comments to june 20th just as we have extended information coming in from the participants so um less so moved excuse me um uh Steve, could you put up that um, address again, the slide, please? Yep, stand by. It'll be just a minute. Thank you. So I'd like to move that we extend the public comment period until, what did you say about the 25th? On the 20th, because we meet on the 25th. June 20th. Yes. June 20th. Okay. I'd like to ex move to extend the public comment period until June 20th. Um, is there a second? I'll second that. All right, so uh, roll call vote, Gloria. Gloria, are you muted? You're muted. All right, well, move, moving on, David. Uh, yes. Uh, Juanita? Yes. I think she said yes. I can't. Yeah. Yes. Um, Terry Mitchell, I don't think she's present anymore. Terry Rodriguez, not present. Ralph Slate. Yes. Uh, Willie, Willie Thomas. If you can yes. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Gloria, are you now unmuted? Unmuted, yes. All right. And Bob McCarroll, yes. All right. So one thing, Bob, um, on the screen it says written public comments are accepted until June 5th, and you just voted for June 20th to accept the email or comments. Correct. Correct. Okay. Clarifying for the screen. All right. So the other item is you've received um, the minutes of May 19. I need a motion to accept them, a second, and then discussion. Make a motion. We accept the minutes of May nineteenth. Second. I would second so that. Moved. Okay. David is seconding. Um, any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, roll call vote. Gloria. Yes. Uh, Juanita. Yes. Uh, Terry Mitchell not here. Terry Rodriguez not here. Ralph. Yes. Uh, Willie Thomas? Yes. Um, yes. Bob McCarroll, yes. Okay, the other item is we have uh, received uh, 
uh, a letter or an email from um, the developed Springfield. I'll let Karen um, talk to you about it because she's the one who got it, um, requesting an extension. Um, I don't have the email pulled up here, but it it's for the uh, the gun block, correct? And it, they just want an extension to uh, September, I believe. I'm sorry, Bob. I don't have that pulled up. I don't have the exact dates. Can you come back to me? Let me look at it. Let me find it. So, well, so they, they need an extension. Obviously, the COVID issue has set them back in this past winter. Um, the small company from Vermont that does the stabilization work for them had one of their staff die in a workplace accident. So between that and, and COVID, they've been set back. And I think that they had asked for September the 15th as a, as a new completion date for the, for the project. So I guess if we could have a motion to extend, um, Gloria's made the motion, have a second. Somebody can just read. Um, I have that now. Um, I can just read it to you. Yes. Due to COVID-19, gun block has been put on hold. We are hoping to start up again June 8th with the second phase and have a completion date of September 15th, 2020. If you need anything else, please um, let me know. And that's from Denise Worst of Develop Springfield. Okay. So, um, motion made, seconded, roll call vote. Um, yep. Juanita? Yes. And Terry Mitchell not here. Terry Rodriguez not here. Ralph? Yes. Uh, Willie? Yes. Bob? Yes. yes. Bob? All right. So the last item on the agenda is the fiscal 21 budget, which I emailed you a correction today. I had sent you previously was an error. Um, Steve, can you put that up on the, on the screen? Um, so this is the time that we send to city council our budget um, for the coming year that begins on July 1. Um, and I assume, Steve, you're looking for it because what's up now is not the budget. Um, That's correct. Please stand by. Okay. Uh, That's going to be a challenge. Keep, keep. If you can keep talking about something else, we'll get it as quick as we can. Well, I'll talk about the budget, and then we'll, people will be able to see it, because the committee members should have, should have gotten it. Um, so we used um, the amount of money that came in at the end of fiscal 19, um, which was a million four twenty eight of the local surcharge. The Department of Revenue, which normally lets communities know what percentage they can expect to get as a distribution, which comes always in November, has said because of the COVID issue and the unknown effect that may have on the real estate market, and therefore what that may do to the fees collected at the registries of deeds that go into the state trust fund, they said at least for now, we should use the very conservative figure of an 11.2% distribution. And for us, that translates into 159,906. Now, originally, we were, we were projected that we're going to get around 300, 400,000. So we may still get that. But right now, they're saying all the community should use a very conservative figure. So that gives us a, a, a budget of $1,587,906. Now, as you know, every year we have to set aside for spending uh, a minimum of 10% of the total budget for community housing, historic resources, open space and recreation. And that's each 
158,791 for each one of them. Um, on the administrative budget, we're programming 100, uh, 1,000 for office supplies, 3,000 for office equipment, 2,000 for a minute secretary, 1,500 for the annual plan and the public hearing ad that we're required by state law to pl place. Um, 4,335 coalition dues, which is based on how much every community raises. It's a sliding scale. Um, 1,500 for our project banners. Um, 31,200 for the part-time CPA consultant. And then we're carrying 18,000 for unanticipated expenses for a grand total of 59,550. The state law caps us at 5%. If we choose to take that, 5% would be up around 100, uh, would be around 76, 77,000. So we're not taking advantage of, of our full administrative 5%. And that leaves us then in our unallocated budget that can either go to housing or historic or open space recreation, 1,051,000. 983. So that's the draft budget. And I guess we should have a motion to accept with a second and then discussion or questions. I make a motion. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, seconded by David. So any questions? Bob, I had one question, just just briefly on, on office equipment. Are those are those known needs or are those just anticipated needs? Those are not even anticipated. Those are maybe needs. Okay. So carrying that figure in each of our budgets from the very beginning. Now, this past year, we used it to buy a, com a laptop computer for parents. Um, and this uh, under office supplies, we used it because we had stationary with our letterhead printed on it. Um, but there's not a specific thing in mind. Now, what happens to administrative money at the end of the fiscal year is it simply rolls over into your unallocated reserve they get to spend on a project for the following year. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So, all right, hearing none, we will have- Oh, actually, Bob, Bob, I have one other question, just to, it's more of a procedural question. You mentioned that the administration money gets rolled over into the unallocated reserves at the end of the year. Uh, does that, and, and, but we are only allowed to spend, you know, 5%, I think is what the number is on administration, but does that mean that if you don't spend your 5% in one year, you, you lose it essentially, so to speak? As far, you couldn't spend 10% on administration the next year, you'd have to spend, the five percent each year correct so okay. where where the reserves for housing historic and recreation they stay there till hell freezes over if you don't allocate them administrative money disappears what you haven't spent disappears and goes into your unallocated reserve so you can't you can't squirrel it away All right, so um, start the roll call vote. Gloria? Yes. Bonita? Yes. Terry Mitchell, Terry Rodriguez, or not here. Ralph? Yes. No. Oh. oh, I miss David. David, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, Willie? Willie, you're, are you on? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. And Bob, yes. So we now come to the end where our next meeting is June 25th. We will begin our deliberations. So your function, your job is to go over the 25 applications. We've already, I've already sent you, but if you've misplaced it, we can send it again. The sort of little rating sheet that we have. Um, please make sure that you have your DOR allowable use chart there so that you're reading the definition of the eligible activities and what you can do to them.
and your, your job at the next meeting is you are coming in with your top eight projects. They don't have to be ranked. They're just the top eight, so you have to obsess about what's number eight and what's number nine. If you choose not to have eight, you can do less. You should think about whether you want to give them how much you want to give them. It can be full funding, what they ask for. It can be less than that. We will then put that up on a big spreadsheet as we've done in the past, just to see how things are falling out. And we will then start discussing all 25 projects, starting with the one that seemed to garner the most interest, down through the ones that garnered lesser interest. Um, and that's what we will do at the next meeting. I'm hoping that we will then have a July meeting when we actually then will actually vote. Ralph, you got a question? Yes, I just want to clarify. And the reason I'm asking this question, I, I do know the answer to it, but I just want to put it out there for the public and for the minutes. A number of the applicants tonight were uh, sort of describing programs that they were running, jobs training, environmental, et cetera. But I just want to clarify for the record, we are not funding jobs training programs, correct? That, that, well, they do not fall into the DOR allowable use chart, which is the state definition, right from the state law. So what we will be doing for, those app, for all the applications is making sure that they fit into the allowable use chart, both in terms of meeting the definition for historic, community housing, open space and recreational space, and meeting the state definition for acquisition, preservation, rehabilitation, creation, and support. Yes, um, as Stuart Saginor, Sa yeah, Sa no, I'm messing his name up. As Stuart from the Community Preservation Coalition had said to us when he came for the initial training, not all good ideas are CPA eligible. And that's what we need to be mindful of as we go through this process of recommending to the city council. I have one other question for clarification. I'm wondering if somebody, and that somebody could be me if possible, you know, it doesn't have to be, but if somebody could research whether a shelter is a housing, is an eligible housing uh, expense. So, so Ralph, I, I made a note to email Stuart to see whether a shelter falls under, I mean, the, as I read the definition of community housing, it, to me it's, it's not clear uh, as to whether it has to be permanent housing. So I will be emailing, I, I will be emailing Stuart. I will also be emailing him as to how you handle um, a project that may be a historic property and, and the private money is doing stuff that's maybe not meeting the secretary standards and CPA is doing the stuff that meets the secretary's standards. I have thoughts on that, but I'll hold them for the next meeting. Okay. Unless you don't want me to hold them, in which case I'll say them. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's part of the deliberations. So, okay, I'll hold them. Because clearly, depending on how that little chart comes out, they, you know, anyway, we will see. So unless someone has anything else to bring up, um, thank you once again to Focus Springfield, Brendan and Steve. Bravo. You know, ba, 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 ba. Thank you for I have a question. I have a question, um, uh, Bob. The, um, the next meeting, are we, are we Zooming or? Well, we don't know yet. And I guess um, we will make that determination. Um, whether by June 5th, where, or 25th, uh, you know? Not likely. Not likely there will be in-person meetings. No. Nope. Okay, so. City I'm meeting. not ready for an in-person meeting. <laughs> and Karen has accepted the daunting task of having the big chart out. So as we go through and list our top eight projects, she's gonna be madly uh, writing away um, as, as a starting point for the discussion. Excited about that. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much. And everyone stay healthy. Yeah, I'll make a motion, we adjourn. Second. Juanita made me this.
or she, she, gave, <laughs> she made it, but she didn't make it necessarily. Wow. Very nice. All right. All right. Thank bye you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.